I do want to, uh, to welcome you here. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Eric Woodard, and I am a board president of Greensboro. And uh, I guess I've been a board member for what, seven, seven years or so. Our executive director, Benjamin Briggs, is there uh, in the back. But one of the things, actually, that, that uh, caught my attention uh, when I moved to Greensboro a number of years ago, driving through the neighborhoods, um, where the, uh, the houses, the architecture of the century modern houses in particular, over in the Bimbo Road area of East Greensboro. And after a, a little research, um, and actually after a Lowenstein modernism home tour, I found that uh, a lot of the most spectacular homes in that area were actually designed by graduates of the architectural engineering program here at AT. And I uh, started to look a little bit more into that history and was fascinated. And, you know, and it's, again, it's been, uh, I think I started this in 2015. So it's been however long ago uh, that was um, with a conversation actually with uh, Sonny Gravelin, um, Mr. Gravelin's daughter. And uh, so that brings us here tonight. We've got to rebuild this exhibit uh, in the exhibit hall. And uh, it is a fascinating exhibit if you haven't been through to, uh, to see that exhibit yet. It'll be here through December, December 9th, I believe. So we have time. And, uh, but again, uh, I do want to welcome you uh, here tonight. Again, this is my first uh, time moderating a panel, so, uh, so I'm excited. And uh, we will go ahead and get started. Um, why, why are we here? Uh, that's one of the, the first questions uh, I want to throw out. I guess some of you are here because your professors suggested uh, that you that you come here, and I won't ask you to, to raise your hands. It doesn't matter. But I hope by the time you leave, you will have uh, will have had a, a change of, of mind, a change of heart, and that man, I really got some information out of there. I really, you know, I got a chance to listen to some amazing. Uh, the panelists you know, sharing some of the, the history of the architectural engineering department that's here at a &T, and and just some of the amazing things that have come out of this department and uh, out, of, out of this school. You know, life-changing, world-changing types of things uh, that have come out of this, this, uh, this institution. So, uh, just a quick definition, uh, we're looking at the legacy and the history and the legacy of the African American architects and builders uh, in Greensboro, out of Greensboro. And again, a lot of them spawned from this very uh, spot that we are in. But uh, just a little history uh, about the architectural engineering program here. Uh, the program here at uh, North Carolina, a &T State University, uh, has a long and rich history that goes back to the beginning of the university and reaches forward to, to influence our very present moment. Over the years, professors, chairs of departments, graduates have gone on to break social, cultural, and racial barriers from architecture to politics. These same people, these architects, uh, were not only responsible for shaping the built environment of numerous neighborhoods and communities in Greensboro and beyond, but also of the local governments. Uh, chaired by William Street uh, from 1949 until his retirement in 85, the department saw an extensive expansion of student enrollment, uh, graduate programs, faculty, and staff. And prior to Street's arrival in 49, Floyd A. Mayfield uh, chaired the newly established department. Now, one of the first graduates uh, was an Edwards, uh, Alonzo Gaston Edwards, or Gaston Alonzo Edwards, and that was in 1901. And uh, he was out of Raleigh, and one of the, if not the first registered architect uh, for North Carolina that we have on record. So the history of the architectural engineering department and, and what you have here uh, goes back, you know, over a century, and, and it's it's an amazing history and one that I would highly recommend that you, you know look into. The time that you have here as a student, I, I would recommend that you look into the, the history of you know this is the legacy that was left for you all. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited to see so many people here and uh, just what you, you all are going to be capable of, of accomplishing. Inspiration, right? Okay, cool. How about a, a, a thumbs up or, or a yes? Yeah, okay, great, great, great. Is that Thompson's class back there? All right, now. 
You get an extra point, 10 points. <laughs> Don't hold me to that. All right, and um, let's quickly look at uh, definition of legacy. Again, we're talking about the legacy and the history and the legacy of uh, the African American architects and builders in Greensboro. Uh, legacy, um, something that is passed on and you know it can take many different forms. Uh, legacy is a lasting has a lasting impact on the world. It is a gift that is passed down through generations. It could be money or property or or even uh, stories like oral histories. Um, Ms. Reed is, is doing oral histories of a lot of the folks who lived in the, the South Bimbo Road area for uh, another project that we're working on. So, so even an oral history can be a legacy. So next time you go home, get with your grandparents or your parents and do some recording. You know, everybody's got phones of some sort that can record, so please do that. You know, we're gonna talk about legacy, history, and, and being able to document that. So for your children's children, don't get me started up here. <laughs> but um, it does mean a lot to me. We've, uh, we've lost some people already that were a part of uh, this project. Um, and uh, it's my heart that we not lose any more before we get the, uh, the, their stories told. So that, uh, you know, because there, there's power in that. There's empowerment in that as well. So, all right. And uh, let's see, basically, history is basically the, the events that we've experienced. So we're gonna look at some of the events that we've experienced uh, individually through others. We're gonna look at that, that legacy, what has been left for us all. And I wanna give you now, uh, introduce you to this amazing panel of, uh, of people that are sitting before you and I, I have their bios but I'm maybe gonna switch it up a little if you all can just share a little bit about who you are and then we'll get into uh, some of the, the questions um, that I have and uh, you know just be thinking about uh, some of your questions as well but uh, we have Professor Ron Bailey I'll, I'll go through, and uh, he's a professor here in the Architectural Engineering Department. Beside him, we have Jane Levy. She is, but you know, it's like, I'm gonna mess her last name up. And, uh, but we have Jane Levy, and uh, she is the daughter of Ed Lowenstein, and he's uh, one of the, uh, in one of the photographs here, uh, an amazing architect. Uh, uh, he, I guess he would be the, uh, the uh, his nickname would be Mr. Modernism. He uh, kind of introduced modernism uh, to the broader Greensboro, uh, credited with changing the face of modernism in Greensboro. And we have uh, Mr. Clinton Gravely, uh, an, an amazing architect on our panel. Uh, a photo of him is here as well. He's got some amazing history uh, with uh, some of the instructors and architects that came out of the, the architectural engineering department here at AT. We have uh, Mr. Robert Powell. Uh, he's also a, uh, I think you put in your bio, a former associate professor? Yes. Okay, so, so he'll, he'll give you a little bit of that. And, and we also have uh, Mr. James Cox. Uh, he is with the Greensboro Housing Authority, the CEO of the Greensboro Housing Authority, and also a graduate of the Architectural and Engineering Department here at a &T. So um, that being said, um, Mr. Bailey, Professor Bailey. Okay. My You'll be standing um, just to speak for you. Uh, okay. Can go well, first. Can can you guys hear him? Do you hear him? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ron Bailey. Uh, I'm an associate professor, at least adjunct professor now because I retired, but I'm still teaching as many courses as I did when I was uh, full time. It's not, I've been. Enjoy A and T. Can you still pick this up? Yeah, it's okay on the table. Okay. I've enjoyed A and T so much that I had only planned to stay at A and T for about five years, but now I find myself in the twenties and maybe thirty years or so. Forty. Such and such. Forty. 40. Uh, I'm sorry. Speak for yourself. This conversation. <laughs> <laughs> 
We had this rivalry going. We both teach, we taught in the uh, design section of the, of the program. Uh, I was brought to A&T to teach uh, architectural design and city planning. Uh, uh, that was my background. I've worked with architects. I've worked with city planners, governments, and so forth. And uh, an opportunity came up for me to work at A&T. So I decided to uh, uh, give A&T a try. And I liked it so much, I'm still here. Even though I'm retired, and they couldn't get rid of me. Um, but I would like to welcome everyone uh, this, this, after, this tonight. And uh, this wonderful exhibit I see, I, I've seen, I, I saw it uh, mentioned somewhere, and someone said something about it. But this is my first time actually seeing the exhibit in the gallery, which I, I it's, it's very, uh, very good. It's a very good exhibit, and I plan to. My student, uh, make sure you tour the gallery, and I don't have. I don't have to give you extra points to tour the gallery. Okay, it's something that you should do in order to further your career uh, and your education here at uh, North Carolina A&T State University. Good evening, I'm Jane Levy, and my real A&T street cred is sitting in the audience right there. My husband, Richard, is a graduate of A&T, so he's a proud Aggie. And, um, can you hear it? Yeah, that might be Is this good? Turn it around, please. <laughs> Yeah, you can speak in that one, and I'll just try to speak. Oh, okay, okay, great. So my father was Edward Lowenstein, who, um, well, I guess I'll tell you more about him a little bit later, but um, I grew up in the house that he designed for his family. Um, it was built in 1964, and I was six years old. Please don't do the math. <laughs> and um, so, I'm here by osmosis, and of course I didn't really appreciate a lot of what he did when I was growing up, but um, I certainly have learned about it since, and I'm just so delighted that you all are here learning about this at a much earlier age than I did. Um, I'm a graduate of Duke University in French literature, <laughs> and um, I, Richard and I have lived here in Greens. Well, I'm from here, and Richard and I have lived here for many, many years and um, still enjoy it a great deal. I am fascinated by this wonderful exhibition and also the Maddie Reed uh, gallery, which I find just absolutely stunning. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Clinton Gravely. I have an architecture firm here in Greensboro, and we have been here for quite a while. Uh, we sort of slowed it down recently, but at one time we had one of the larger firms here in the Greensboro area. In fact, at one time we were number three in the triad. We had about 26 people. We, I'm resident in uh, eight states plus D.C. Uh, so we used to work all up and down the eastern uh, seaboard. Uh, we have sort of cut that down to just North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia, and uh, eventually just maybe North Carolina, and, uh, and then eventually just Greensboro. Uh, you need to come this way. Okay, no problem. Well, maybe I'll use my outside voice. Can you hear me? <laughs> uh, my name is Bob Powell, uh, referred to as Professor P. Um, and so, unfortunately, probably most of you I don't know because the last two years between COVID and virtual, uh, I, last year was my last year teaching here and really last couple of years with uh, virtual stuff. I didn't really have the opportunity to teach face to face with you, but I, I taught at A&T for 22 years. Uh, prior to that, I was in uh, private practice here in Greensboro uh, with a couple of firms. 
and, and my own firm for, for a little bit. Um, in terms of the topic today, I tried to tell Eric, um, I'm the least knowledgeable person here about all the stuff that's here. I, I want to focus on Jane and Clint. That's the story. Uh, your dad and the people that he hired and the one who's here today is just an amazing story for Greensboro. And um, Eric, I'll just kind of, let me tell your story that Eric has this fascination with the story of Greensboro, an, a, a, an important story in Greensboro. And so he's the one who brings us all together for all this stuff that we do. And the idea that, if, if I can share Jane, your dad in the 50s during segregation in Greensboro hired how many black architects? Three or four or five, some number, some outrageous number. And others. And others. <clears throat> and the deal was her, her dad being this um, uh, creator of modern, mid-century modern architects hired these black architects who then also designed mid-century modern architecture. And in particular, the story is that given segregation, they did it in this one particular, they did it lots of places, but there is a focus in this one neighborhood that where they all worked. And maybe a couple of you toured with Eric and I a couple weeks ago, and that story is just, it's, it's just ridiculous. It's, out, it's, it's amazing. And so, and um, Clint is frankly the last living architect of this group that, that, that did this stuff in the 50s. So uh, that's why I'm here tonight is, is, to, is to hear that story. And so I'm, I'm James Cox. I am, as mentioned, um, Chief, Op Chief Executive Officer for the Greensboro Housing Authority now. And, um, you know, I was excited to be a part of the panel, but um, I also had to, to step back to understand uh, the perspective and, and a part of the story I think that I would share and will share um, is in relation to the streets. Uh, William Street and Louis Street, uh, who was the chair, he was the chair of the architectural engineering department here at A&T, the days when it was a five plus year program, officially. <laughs> and um, so I had a unique opportunity to spend quite a bit of time, uh, the latter years for Mrs. Street in particular, who shared a number of stories. Um, and I didn't realize I was getting, um, you know, that's why it's important to hear the stories and to steward those stories and to pass those stories on so that the, the legacy can continue. Um, and we'll get more into that a little later. But I was an adjunct professor here for a while, assistant to the dean for a while. Um, and I was in your seats about 30 plus years ago. Yeah, and so uh, that's it. Thank you, if you help me just imagine the That, that round of applause, now used by outdoor voice as well, was for, again, the history and the legacy uh, that they have made for all of us. We can leave that one up. Yeah, that one on the table. That'll be for the, the three of you on this end. But uh, the, uh, that round of applause was for the history and, and the legacy that, that you have sitting before you. Uh, these, these people have touched people and our people who have touched the lives of so many others, um, you know, just as they are as, a, as individuals, but also uh, the, the legacy of like for uh, Mrs. Livy, or, you know, her father uh, and some of the others here, you know, actually as, as architects, you know, building our, our built environment. On the table, uh, we're, we have uh, a few photos. And we have uh, Mr. Gravely here. We have, of course, Mr. Lowenstein, in the middle, Mr. Jenkins, he was a graduate of, in 1949 of the architectural and engineering uh, program here. Uh, let's see, Mr. Gray, he was also uh, an architect, uh, I think he graduated in 41. And uh, of course, 
you know, Professor Chairman of the Architectural Engineering Department at William Street. And uh, he was uh, held that position from 1949 through 85. And uh, again, uh, as I gave a little bit of information there, you know, under his tutelage, the, the department grew phenomenally. And again, it made space so that each of you could be here tonight. And uh, so we're gonna just get into a little bit of the history of some of these folks. Uh, we'll start with uh, Ed Jenkins. Uh, again, his photo there. He was among the, the few African-American architects practicing in North Carolina in the mid 20th century. Uh, he worked in Greensboro office of Ed Lowenstein, uh, basically from 49 to 62, and where he started his own firm in, in 62. Like Lowenstein, uh, Jenkins favored modernist designs and innovation, and his work fulfilled the desire of many black clients to have modernist buildings, expressive of progress. And it was uh, quoted that the, the, the modernist mindset was one of uh, promise of the future held by a lot of African Americans in the post-World War II era. There were technologies that came about through uh, World War II. Uh, there were processes that came about that allowed the building uh, of uh, the design and building of a lot of the mid-century modern uh, architecture, you know, with the, the expansive columns, you know, the glass fronts. How many are familiar with mid-century modern architecture? By a show of hands. Okay. Um, so a few, basically the, the time period of mid-century modern, anywhere from the 30s through the 60s, 1930s through the 1960s, I like to extend it a little further out into the 70s, that's just me. But, um, but it deals with uh, openness, you know, prior to that, a lot of the architecture, you know, had a lot of ornamentation, you know, columns and a lot of, you know, finials and things like that. The modernism just uh, took out a lot of the orna ornamentation. It was form follows function, you know, started, uh, a form of it uh, started uh, with the Bauhaus uh, in Germany in the 30s. Some of the folks, uh, Gropius and some of the others, came to uh, to the U.S. Uh, in the 30s uh, to Harvard. They introduced uh, modernism uh, to to the U.S. pretty much. And uh, A and T though has had a history of modern architecture as well um, as it, as it turns out because uh, Ms. Levy's father came in 45. Uh, and uh, to Greensboro, and uh, he, he and, you know, came into the, the modernism, uh, but that, that mindset, modernist mindset, was here uh, in the uh, architectural engineering department as well, uh, here at a and So it was a, uh, a zeitgeist, or, a, or, a, or a, uh, again, a mindset of, of progression, a mindset of uh, forward thinking. And uh, again, it, it appealed to a lot of African-American folks. And again, you can just drive along the neighborhoods in South Bimbo Road in East, uh, East Greensboro and see some of the amazing architecture that deals with that. Openness, uh, you know, a lot of uh, flat roofs, uh, a lot of large windows that invited the outdoors in. Um, your, your home is an amazing uh, example of that. Um, it also deals with, uh, you know, utilizing uh, natural, uh, like building materials, stone, and uh, there was a time also with uh, concrete. Uh, again, one of the innovations, uh, post World War II uh, innovations. Uh, the post and beam structures, where you can have a large expanse, uh, interior expanse, without having physical walls, uh, and that, that's another element of modernism. And and it's uh, it's an amazing concept, and and uh, I would recommend uh, looking into that a little further. But the architects that that's, that came out of this architectural engineering program had that mindset again, that mindset of progression and moving forward, and designed a lot of uh, buildings, from uh, churches to uh, commercial buildings to residences for a lot of the uh, the the middle class and upper middle class um, uh, African Americans, you know, again, who were mindful. A lot of them were professors uh, here, teachers. There were uh, business owners. There were people who were uh, in, in the politics. Some of the first, uh, one of the, the first um, African Americans to be elected in the Greensboro City Council in the 50s actually commissioned a home by uh, Ed, Ed Jenkins and uh, is, you know, the home currently stands on the corner of Ross and uh, Ellis in the South Member Road neighborhood. I would recommend that you just take some time to drive through through that neighborhood. And uh, let's see here. I had a lot of information here, but I don't think we're gonna 
be reading that because I'm interested in the stories of, uh, of the folks we have here. And another thing that Benjamin did, Benjamin Briggs, the executive director of uh, preservation, I call him the super sleuth. Uh, if you need to know anything about the history of Greensboro, Benjamin is the go-to person. And uh, this is something that he's pulled together just in, I guess, the last few weeks on the, the history of the architectural and engineering program here at A&T. And most of, a lot of this information, I would venture, is new information, things that we haven't seen uh, you know, in the, the general knowledge. Uh, so there's so much more to be told. I, I say that to say that there's so much more to be told. There's so much more to learn. There's so much more to, to glean from, from uh, this, this uh, institution and, and, again, from you all, you know, as the folks who are going to carry this thing forward. Yes. Clint, did you have, did you overlap at all with, with Jenkins, Blue Jenkins? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I guess I need to start back when uh, I was from Greensboro, North Carolina. The big city is all over Greensboro. And, uh, and I went away to school. Hear that? To Howard University. And then when I came back, you know, I couldn't find a job. During that time, the only firm that was hiring minorities uh, was Ed Lawstein, James Revolver. Uh, and I looked around and, and uh, tried to find a job. My, my father and my grandfather were contractors. And so, uh, <clears throat> There were a lot of advertisements and I went to those places and they, when they found out I was a minority, they said, oh, I hired somebody else or my cousin is going to take the job, that sort of thing. So anyway, um, I, I went to Ed Lowenstein and um, he told me, he said, well, I, I'm going to have an opening in, in about three months. And he said, uh, we'd like to have you. So I was working with my father and that sort of thing. So I came back and went with him those three months. Now, Ed Jenkins was there at the Lawnstein office when I went there. And so I had an opportunity to work with him, uh, with Ed Jenkins briefly. Um, because, um, well, first of all, I had, when I graduated from Howard, I went into service and uh, I was an the officer there. And I was in charge of planning project section, which is pretty much the same thing that you're doing, that we do in architecture. But I did work with Ed Jenkins for a while, and I learned a lot from Ed. And uh, I learned a lot about uh, NT as well. Uh, Ed, Ed Jenkins and I were in the same office working together at, at, at Lost Team. And um, when <clears throat> Ed Jenkins left, uh, I helped him a little bit, you know, in the evening and that sort of thing, to try to have him get his office started. And so I did have that uh, contact uh, with him. Um, I owe a lot to uh, Ed Lowenstein. Uh, without uh, Ed Lowenstein, I, I probably would not even be in Greensboro today because I had. Uh, been offered jobs in Washington, D.C., and uh, but I wanted to come back because my family was here in North Carolina, and uh, so I came <clears throat> and worked with Ed and uh, enjoyed that relationship. In fact, I became an associate uh, in that firm, and uh, I went to Ed one day. I told him, I said, well, I think I want to uh, to uh, start my own office, which is something I always wanted to do. And um, he said, well, we don't, we don't want to lose you. But the thing he told me, he said, well, if you gotta go, go. He said, but you always have a home here. And when he told me that, I, I knew I was going on and to try to make it work. And so anyway, we did open the office. And uh, then I had a hard time getting, getting work. And so I had two people working with me. They were graduate architects from A&T. From and um, 
couldn't get enough work here in Greensboro. So I decided, so well, maybe what I'll do is uh, spend one day a week uh, riding around North Carolina. I would go to Charlotte one week, Durham one week, that sort of thing. And so we began to get work all over North Carolina. In fact, we had more work in Charlotte. Probably had more jobs in Charlotte now than we have in Greensboro. But after that was a success, I got registration in other states and I began to do the same thing in other states, you know. And so we ended up working in eight states plus DC. And uh, we ended up with, with a lot of work during that time. In fact, really, uh, when some of the architects in Greensboro did not have work, uh, they would ask me to use one of their personnel until they got work. Because we, we, were, we were not uh, really uh, focusing on Greensboro per se. We were trying to do it uh, wherever, so we would not depend on one particular area or one particular uh, state, really. And it did work out uh, well for us. But uh, I will say, too, that during that time, you know now, minorities had a, had a hard time getting, getting jobs, but women were not hired either as architects. And uh, I think Ed Lawson had a lot to do with that because he was teaching over at uh, uh, Women's College at the time, but uh, teaching injury design. And so he began to hire women. And then when we started our firm, we hired women. So it was a combination of uh, minorities as well as women uh, not being hired uh, during that time. But uh, to go a little bit further with uh, Ed Jenkins, because um, Ed, Ed was a good architect, as you can see from some of the uh, work that he has done. But I will say that uh, Mr. Street was a good architect and a good instructor too. He and Mr. Gray. Uh, and he had a very good program uh, during that time. And uh, they taught, uh, you know, everything about architecture. I mean, from work and drawing to everything. And uh, it worked out well. Um, Mr. Street and, and Mr. Gray taught, uh, they got a grant to uh, teach Fallout shelter design, you know, that was a big issue back during that time. And I took that course, and that's when I got a chance to know the street very well during that time. And uh, I was really uh, amazed as how he handled that crowd. I mean, he had some hostile people in there, but uh, he was, he was, he, he handled it well. And, uh, after that time, I, I did very good in his class. And so he asked me about uh, whether I would come and help them write a book on photo shelf design. And I went to Ed Lowenstein and I said, I said, well, I told him the street, I said, well, maybe you need to talk with Ed. And so he did. And uh, Ed said, well, uh, how long would it take? He said, six months. And so I said, well, okay. You know, so I went and worked with Mr. Street and Mr. Gray for six months to write this book about fallout shelter design. So I got to know them even more then. And uh, like I say, Mr. Street, I, I can't say enough for Mr. Street and Mr. Gray because I got a chance to work with them personally and got a chance to know how great they were and the interest they had uh, in students. But uh, I think that gives a little bit of a background on, on uh, where I came from. Yeah. My father was from Chicago and he went to um, MIT where he got his Bachelor of Architecture. And I believe William Street was his roommate at, at, M at M MIT. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. And um, I will say that on your behalf, my father hired you because you were the right man for the job and he hired the others because they were the right person for the job. And I think that applied to 
I, I do think that applied to women um, as well. But, you know, you have to remember this was, he started his firm in, what, 1946, something like that. And um, he integrated this firm, uh, you know, a decade before the Greensboro Four, uh, before we had, you know, the, the sit-ins at the Woolworth lunch counter. And so I feel, I'm, I'm just really proud of that, um, that he sort of, in his own way, laid the seeds for some pretty good things that happened later. And um, as, as Clint said, uh, women were a great minority in the field of architecture. And just to tell you a little bit about the class he taught at what was then women's college, um, he, he had a class of 23 women who were taking home ec and art and art and learning all this. And he, my father felt that the classroom just wasn't enough for them, that they needed some field experience. And so they, these women designed, um, designed and hired the professionals to build what they, what the, not, not the university, what the college dubbed commencement houses. And the, we know of three of them. One of them was very sadly torn down, but there are two that I know that it exist. And one of them is um, on Rockford Road in Irving Park, and another one is in Sedgefield on Gaston Road. And uh, the, these women, not only these, uh, black architects who went on to have wonderful, wonderfully successful careers, still do. Uh, but, but many of the women in this class did as well. And I don't know if you know Lisa Crawford, who is the executive director of the Greensboro Symphony, but her, her aunt was in one of these classes, and her name is Anne Green, and she had a, a wonderful uh, career in, in architecture. So I just want to give a lot of credit to the next generation who carried on this legacy. And uh, just one thing with uh, Mr. Gravely and his firm, um, like some of the buildings that you pass uh, on campus uh, were designed by uh, Mr. Gravely, uh, Mr. Street, uh, Mr. Gravely was responsible for the Bloomfield Library, <laughs> and um, and uh, along uh, in the South Memorial Road area, Shadow Baptist Church and and uh, Providence uh, Baptist Church, and, and uh, is it Harkett Funeral Home? Yes, <laughs> yes, uh, Harkett Funeral Home. Uh, uh, Williams, uh, the attorney office okay. down there. Uh, the Patrick's office, the doctor's office, right. uh, United Institution, Baptist Church. So we have it's a lot. A church of in North Carolina. He did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we have we we have done uh, about 160 churches. Yeah. Wow. So it's quite a few churches. And that's number two on our category. We have done more monthly family housing. Uh, about 180 of those projects, but those. Churches and then the university work was number three. We've done about 50 some university projects. So we have tried to maintain a variety of uh, buildings and a variety of plans as we uh, maneuver through this uh, architecture career. And when you first started, uh, Mr. Gravely, uh, you said that. Uh, in, in a conversation that we, we had a little while ago, uh, you said that you had some hesitation initially about uh, starting your your architecture firm. <clears throat> well, when I was with my father, uh, they sent father sent me to school with the idea that uh, they had a construction firm, and uh, with the idea that I would learn a little bit about design and then come back and work with them because they would get a lot of requests for design build kind of things. But when I found out a little bit more about architecture, I found out I needed to 
uh, go through an apprenticeship, which is three years, in order to become licensed. And so that's when I, uh, you know, had to get a job and everything to go through that process. And after getting into that, working with uh, Ed Longstein, and learning a little bit more about the field of architecture, uh, I decided that maybe uh, I like that a little bit better than construction. <laughs> and uh, so that's how I ended up being uh, in architecture. My father was disappointed. But, um, and I guess, like I said, my grandfather was a contractor, my father was a contractor, and by me not going to construction, that stopped that right at that point. But um, I've enjoyed architecture. Uh, Clint, you know, I've been reading up on this a little bit. It seems like a number of black architects, the way you all got started was coming from a line of contractors. That, that, that uh, so for instance, I was reading up on Robert Taylor, uh, who was the first black licensed architect also from MIT. Um, but the deal was his father was a, was a builder also. And so you had kind of that nurturing and, and kind of understanding of, of building before you, as a foundation for the architecture. Well, I think that's true. In fact, uh, not to cry it in, in uh, my father used to build a lot of houses. And at one summer, we were, he was building uh, some houses, about five or six houses that, that were similar, three bedroom houses. And uh, so this is when I came home from Howard. And uh, I took pride in, 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 in my dad said, well, you know, let me do the, uh, with, a, with a crew, let me do the rough frame. And we worked, we were young, young guys too. And we kept ahead of the finishing carpenters. We did about six houses that summer. And, uh, but learning about that, even, I'll say this too, even when I was at Howard, I remember uh, one of the instructors was, was talking about drywall. And he was saying, well, you know, drywall only comes in uh, a certain size. And so I corrected him on that. I said, well, you know, it comes in another size too. <laughs> that didn't go too well with my instructor <laughs> at the time. <laughs> but it was something I had worked with, right. you know, right. every day. And he's finally, he came back and apologized later. He said, yeah, he said, I found out you were right. You know, it does come in, in, in five eighths and a half inch and that sort of thing. And so in working with my father, uh, I did learn a lot about that. And uh, I'll say this too, that uh, once I started my firm, Mr. Street had asked me about coming over to teach part-time. And I did come over and teach part-time. And the course that I taught was construction methods and material, you know, teaching the students about construction and how everything came together. And I did that for about three years to the point where I, I, I had a problem trying to keep up with clients and also, you know, with class. And so I had to stop at that point. But I enjoy teaching that and I enjoy working with Mr. Street. I, I can't say enough about Mr. Street and the program that, that he had. And uh, that's a good segue for uh, Mr. Cox. Uh, if you can share a little bit uh, of your relationship with the streets? Uh, yes. And so, well, so much has been said and so many different, uh, you know, connections. And just hearing the story about your father, I think, teaching at Bennett and the um, oops, Women's College, Bennett, I'm assuming that. No, uh, USCG. USCG. Uh, women's, college. women's College. Women's, women's College. college. Oh, women's College. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just thinking about Miss Street and their connection to, 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 to Bennett and from a design perspective, it was so, so important. Uh, but I can say this, that um, from the street standpoint, not only were, was he an excellent architect and, and impacted so many lives, he was also a craftsman. Uh, and, and a lot of the furniture that he actually made in his house and uh, in, in actually building his own house, um, and some of the techniques that he actually used, I would say, uh, predecessors of things that are being done now. For example, um, you're familiar with um, decking material now that has self and, um, channels where the water won't flow 
through the seams? Well, he designed the upper deck <laughs> in such a way uh, years before uh, that was even thought of where he put in an internal channel that saw, caused the uh, water to seep out to such that it was actually a terracotta um, um, tile over that deck and it was preserved even being on the north side of the building. Uh, it's, and I'm familiar with all of this because I helped uh, Mrs. Street maintain some of that over time and, and getting in there and actually seeing. I, was, I said, this man was light years ahead uh, with some of the construction techniques, you talk about materials and methods and some of the things that he did. Um, and I remember just uh, in their house in particular, um, him using redwood, right? Uh, because he knew uh, not just the ability, but the, the longevity of it, and then how to preserve it. And so even some of the furniture, long furniture is probably still there right now, he made specifically out of redwood that tied back to the side into their home. Uh, it was so many different things. So young people, I'm just saying from a design standpoint, never limit yourself and lock yourself in. Uh, always be stretching out and seeing how you can uh, reach higher limits and higher heights. Uh, never be restricted. Never take no for an answer. Continue to expand and continue to do some things that would just expose you to a number. If you have the opportunity to work construction, I'm telling you, it's the mo one of the most valuable experiences that you can actually have. Uh, because I started myself with my uncle uh, in construction you know, at the age of 12. Um, you know, that was just haul. That was just labor. He was just hauling lumber and but stuff. Watching, but I was watching again and learning uh, through that process. Even when making a decision to come to North Carolina A and T, where I was going to Hampton University, that was my ultimate goal was to go to Hampton. Um, until I visited this campus and found out about architecture engineering the program and met Mr. Street for the first time uh, on, on a college visit, and so. Uh, but those types of things, understanding how the interconnections of design and materials and all the pretty things that you design, how does it really work? <laughs> can, you, can you construct these things? And so uh, it, it's, it's a lot of things you know, that we, you'll continue to hear, but uh, just listen to the stories, you know, capture these things, understand that you're standing on legacy. I mean, generations of generations. And you're talking about the 40s and the 50s where you, people of color, we were limited in a lot of different areas, but you hear someone that gave opportunity, um, and then to see a businesses that would tr thrive, what Mr. Uh, Gravely probably could tell us a lot of stories about is how, <laughs> who'd you have to go to to get jobs, right? And to get work, because it wasn't easy. And that's why institutions like the black church Right? <laughs> yeah. And um, multifamily homes. Did you do Prince Graves and some of those other? Yeah. And so the multifamily sites where there was an opportunity resource that came in even through the black church to establish, you know, multifamily products, you know, for the next, you know, generation. So it's so many connections. So we can't take these things, you know, lightly at all. And then we talk about the homes. I, I, I mean, me and Miss Street would talk all the time about all the rich history and how one day it would be nice just to have tours, you know, of Benbow Park, how we could connect the Civil Rights Museum with started and how we can make this a destination point. Because not only from an architectural standpoint, from a builder standpoint, but just the generation of leaders that was in that particular community <laughs> at that particular time is legacy, you know, within itself. Uh, and we continue to go on and on, you know, about how, and, and those places were not just homes that were designed. They specifically designed some of those homes um, so that they could entertain. She would tell us the stories because it wasn't a lot of going out. What they were doing Friday, Saturday nights, they would go to everybody's home. That's right. And so where you had the basements, where you had the open spaces, so they could entertain and bring families. So that were true house parties, <laughs> you know. Um, but she would tell the stories about how they would go from home to home and how they would entertain um, and, and shared stories and, and families came and grew together. It was a true community. So, but um, yeah, and so it's so much rich history uh, that we continue to talk about.
but I'll yield. Yeah. Yes. Here you go. On that same line, um, I would also like to invite your classes here to our house so that you could see the house my father built for his family. And, um, you know, I, I would love for your classes to come. And anyway, oh. that's, an, that's an invitation, a firm, a firm invitation. All right. Excellent, excellent. That that is, uh, and, and Jane, uh, Ms. Levy, I, I've known you for a few years, Ms. Jane, but Ms. Levy is uh, is, is gracious in uh, in that, that offer, and she has always been gracious, ever, and 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 uh, Mr. Levy has always been gracious in uh, in their their home. And I think the word is shameless. shameless. <laughs> we we love we love people who love modernist architecture and. You're welcome to come, <laughs> really. <laughs> I think one of the uh, important things, is, I, tell, I tell my students all the time, is don't limit yourself. Uh, look around you at the environment in terms of what you see and see the importance of it. A lot of times we limit ourselves. Now I'm just, I listen to the other speakers, and I'm just a little poor farm boy who grew up in Virginia. And I went to Howard University and I learned a lot from being in the nation's capital. I had a chance to see famous people. I had a chance to work with famous people in my work studies and so forth. And it gave me an opportunity to see what the world was really like. The world is not, it, it's large, but it's small. And there is a lot of opportunity out there. I've talked to some of the people in Greensboro. They tell, they tell me how they got started. They got started just by doing what other people would do. And that's how they got started. They took building projects and turned, them, it turned those projects into dreams. And from there, other people wanted the same dream, and they wanted to dream further, and that's how they became famous. You students now have an opportunity. When I was coming up, like uh, uh, Mr. Gravely said, we didn't have that opportunity. We were limited in terms of where, where we could go and who we could work for. But by us standing on the shoulders of others who opened the door for, for us, now we can go place. I never dreamed that I could go to Oxford University or Cambridge University or MIT. But then I saw when Mr. Street, some of the others had gone to MIT back when we weren't, uh, people would say, well, you're not going to MIT and Illinois and so forth. And they opened the door for us. And then I look at those projects in outside in the gallery I said, those are important for young people to see that these men way back in 18 such and such or, or early 1900s or such and such, they had a dream and they made that dream happen. Just like Mr. Gravely right here. Mr. Gravely worked for his father, but then he developed a dream and he continued that dream until where he is today with all those churches and all those housing developments and so forth, you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing. I tell my students, don't limit yourself. It's a, it, it seems to be a big world, but it's a small world out here. And the people you meet, uh, I heard someone say the other, the same people you meet going up are the same people you meet coming down. So you have to take advantage of the opportunities that are given you. Um, Mr. Street, I never forget Mr. Street telling me, and I'm just going to tell this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Street, 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 Mr. street story. I, I, there are so many Mr. Streets out here in the world. But I was told that there was a job at A&T, would I be interested in such and such? Why don't I call them? I, but before I could call, I got a call from the dean. And the dean told me, he said, uh, Mr. Baylor, we would love for you to come to A&T. We heard about your background in city planning and all like that, and we got courses in city planning. We'd love for you to come to A&T. You got a background in art, and that's what we need. Mr. Street was the kind of man who said, 
after the dean called me, Mr. Street's gonna call you, everything is rosy and all like that. Mr. Street was the kind of man who did not play. He told me, he said, Mr. Bailey, we would love to have you to come to A&T. I said, oh boy. Then he turned around and he said, Mr. Bailey, you can come if you want to, and you don't have to come if you don't want to. He was telling me that he meant business. And that's the way you should take your education, is you, is that it's something that you have to be serious about. And I never, that's one thing I grasped about Mr. Street's student, the students in architectural engineer, the five year program, they were serious. Because they knew that the professors they had did not play. They knew what the environment was like and you had better not play. Uh, you, I heard him tell some students, they only need three credit hours. He said, well, mister, I'll see you next semester. <laughs> that's what kind of man he was. And uh, so, I mean, that's really, I'm so glad to see all of you out here tonight. Uh, my students, the other students, and so forth. And, and take advantage of well, what's out here. Take advantage of what's out here. And, and I do see a couple of um, Professor Street, Mystery students out here. If you could just kind of raise your hands and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about what it was like to be a student under Mr. Street. Because I, I hear these stories. They weren't stories. No, they were not, they were not students. That was Mr. Street. Mr. Fox, I'm telling you. I didn't see who else. Dr. Alpusabo Structure. Mr. Street called me uh, uh, Structural Analysis. I took design one under uh, Gerald uh, uh, Gray, and I was also a student worker in facilities under Mr. Gray. And it was a five-year program, and it was difficult. A lot of people did not want to stay in school five years. They get a degree, but it was a professional degree, and a lot of times we hung around almost six. But we were well educated. When I left, I knew how to design. I knew how to design a building. I knew how to do structures, design steel beams, reinforced concrete. I did it all. I even worked, as Mr. Powell said, I worked construction as a laborer. And in my subsequent career, I did the same thing, becoming a project manager, design manager. But I was well prepared when I left a and AE department. I was well prepared. And I think Mr. Street and those instructors, even Mr. Gravity. Mr. Gravity used to be on my uh, dissertations for justifying my jury, just, justifying my design. And I was. 18, 19 years old, and that's been a long time ago. But he used to come in and do that for us. Give us an idea, this is what you're gonna to have to do when you get out, and don't be afraid of it. He was, very, he was very patient. Don't be afraid of it. It can happen. It will happen. And I enjoyed my career. Had a wonderful time. This is awesome. Um, came to A&T in 1964 and met Bill Street and uh, Gerard Gray and uh, was also in one of Mr. Gravity's courses as well. And it was quite the experience. They were rudimentary, straight to the point, did not accept no for an answer and looked for the best out of you as far as production, it was a very serious time. I had, my first conflict was I wanted to be in the marching band, the blue and gold marching machine. Freshman and sophomore years, Mr. Street told me the second, uh, my sophomore year, what do you want to do, mister? What, what, what do you want to be? You want to be an architect or you want to be a musician? So I had to decide right then and there what my, so I got out of the band and I devoted my, uh, education to architectural engineering and uh, as has been illustrated <clears throat> they were just awesome professors 
and people who were very knowledgeable and would do anything they could to assist and help you. They would even come in the labs at night. This time of night, one night we were up mimicking uh, Bill Street and he walked up behind one of the guys and we all froze. We could not say a word to him. Uh, what do you want to do, Mr. Huh? What do you want to be? And uh, it, it was just those kind of highlights that I still reflect on uh, and all the other things. That, but as students, we were serious. We lived in Cherry Hall. We literally, uh, my, my girlfriend on campus was looking for me. She knew where I was because we had to study and do those things that were vital and necessary. And the whole connect was that the institution here, a and at that time college, almost went to Hampton Institute back in that time. But I'm so blessed that I came to a and uh, it, it, is, it is just great. The education uh, had to stop for a while. Unfortunately, I got drafted, had to go to Vietnam um, a couple of years, but came back and finished. Uh, but that, that was the blessing in terms of, of what took place. But the transition, let me explain one thing before I close, was that I was able to transition even to the Department of, well, the School of Edu uh, Agricultural and Engineering, or the, you know, agriculture. So I got to meet J.W.R. Grandy, who was at that time looking after the campus, but he was one of the first black registered landscape architects in North Carolina. So I worked with Mr. Grandy. When I came back out of Vietnam, I didn't finish in AE. I started, but I finished, we started the landscape architecture program, Dr. Fountain, Charles Fountain, in that area. So we had the, black, the first black landscape architectural program uh, here at A&T. So I worked with that for a couple of years. But because of Dr. Fountain and the, the foundation of Mr. Street, I got into the School of Design at NC State and was able to complete landscape a master's in landscape architecture because of the connection because of the severity of what we had to do and all those things that were very pertinent to me and my interests and where my focus needed to be but i thank this institution those great men and everybody associated with the various departments that really gave me a base to build on and a t is awesome just want you to know Please tell your name. Your name. Ronald Harris. And your name. Thomas Sinclair. Thank you. Wow. Um, is anyone else excited? <laughs> I'm excited. I'm absolutely excited. Um, let's see how much time do we have? Yeah. Oh yeah, we have plenty of time. Plenty of time. And uh, is there, there anything else that's pressing? Yeah, I, I want to say that um, a and has a legacy of, a and has a, a legacy of producing the best. Mm -hmm. We have uh, recently, we had a Dr. Hood. Uh, he uh, is a professor in Berkeley, distinguished professor at Berkeley, and he is known all over the country. At University of Wisconsin, I had a new uh, uh, flyer, and there was uh, Mr. Hood, landscape architecture person from North Carolina a and I got something from Virginia Tech. There was Mr. Hood, uh, outstanding uh, speaker, lecturer at uh, Virginia Tech. And then also I've had students who were on HGTV, and they were, basically finalists on design in spaces. So we have here outstanding students. We have here students that can, let this, what's that word, Aggie do? They can Aggie do. Uh, so it's just up to you to accomplish, accomplish something. You know, those men you see on that gallery they accomplished something, you know, for all of us, all of us, no matter what, they have accomplished something that we can look up to. You know, they didn't have, may not have what we have now, but they took that little bit that they did have and make something out of it. 
Eric, are there any questions coming from? I imagine somebody might have some questions out in the audience. Uh, I think Mr. Gravely and then after Mr. Gravely, I just wanted to uh, mention one thing to to let some of the young people know how far we've come. Uh, back when I was getting licensed in various states, during that time you had to go to that particular state and take an exam and to have reciprocity where you don't have to do all that. But I went to uh, Tennessee. I drove to Tennessee and I had to be there at 9 o'clock the next morning and uh, to take the exam. And when I went in, there was about maybe six or seven people there. And the only thing they asked me, said, why would you, as a black person, want to be an architect? That was the only question that they asked. <laughs> and when I told them, you know, about growing up, my father, that sort of thing, I said, okay. They didn't ask me anything about the code, about the state of Tennessee, or anything. And that sort of thing happened in a lot of situations back then. When I, when I went into AIA, you know, I was the only person there, and really, uh, you know, about 30 people, they didn't treat me too well, really. And none of them had much to say and that sort of thing. And uh, during that time, they came up and asked, well, why would you want to be an architect? You know, blacks don't have any money. You, you know, you, you're not going to be able to survive. But we've come a long way, and I wanted to point that out to some of the young people here, some of the things that uh, we've had to go through uh, over the years. And let me mention a little bit about Jane. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ed, Jane rode horses, and this is a little bit of way out of, out of uh, architects right now. And Mr. Lowenstein, when uh, his, favorite, his favorite word when something was going wrong, or he had something with G, G. And he would come into the office some day and he said, gee, I had to buy this horse for Jane. <laughs> and so, and uh, he'd tell us how much the horse costs and everything, but uh, she was really into horses. And that's how I got to know uh, Jane back then, because of, uh, and, I, and you know, I had horses too, you know, over the years too, but uh, I wanted to just pass it out to her. <laughs> We're not going into that. <laughs> well, let's, let's first of all, we're going to open it up for questions from the audience, but I want to give uh, this panel uh, just a, a round of applause. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Yeah, I'll start off. It's just um, this has been fantastic for me because um, I came to AT and I think Bob, I think you were one of the first people that I had the opportunity to interface with when I first came here. And I came here as director to the Visual Arts Program. And um, Bob used to I used to see Bob I could come back more from the from the cab and he was like you're all art, right? And I was like, yeah. He's like, you're a designer, right? Yeah. We need to do things. And I said, you're right. We do need to do things. And the, there's a question I have about how in this environment, even though, you know, we know the struggle that it's been, because I mean, even in the world of, of design, I was told, you know, same kind of thing. And I, I'm, I'm probably at least, you know, 20 year difference in, in, in age groups of that time, the 60s to the 80s, right? Then it turned around and they said they said to me, you know, you want to be a, a art director? Yeah, of course, I'm a, that's why I'm here. And they said, well, I'll tell you what, if you want to be an art director and you expect to see another black person at that job, you better take a mirror with you to work. <laughs> And that was as honest, and, and a white person was saying that to me, and it was honest and clear. Nobody was cutting corners or telling me. They were like, if you expect to see somebody that looks like you there, I guess you're going to take them here. And so for me, it didn't stop or deter me from, you know, when you stand and you, they ask you those questions. So, if, you know, you plant your feet firmly, and you're like, this is what I want to do. And if confronting you is what I got to do to get there, I hear you, but I, I'm not going back. You know, and so 
on this campus, you know, landscape architecture, um, you know, the history of, of fashion design, the door in, home economics, there's a whole history of how black people entered this, the different fields of design. This isn't just about architectural engineering or, we're in a field of design, which means that we build the way people interface with the work. With everything, from the products, to the clothing, to the spaces, we, we bridge that, we facilitate all of those spaces. However, in the educational space, we have been, we are, the siloed groups. And it, and it, to me, it takes the power away from what we can do if we were allowed to actually work as a community. If the fashion people were talking to the landscape people, they were talking to the, the, the designers, they were talking to the, architect, the, the architectural engineers, and if all the designers were able to actually communicate, how, what could we do? We talk about greatness. If we're great individually, can you imagine how great we could be? We could change how people do everything, anything. And even agriculture, gentlemen said, if we could talk to the designers in agriculture, you know? I just don't understand why these silos exist and how, what do you think, this panel has a great varied set of minds, what do you think we could do to actually pull some of those walls down and integrate these disciplines? So I got I want to answer two halves to your question. There's two questions you got there. One is that you and I are from the next generation beyond these folks. And so frankly, the opportunities that we've had are greater than, than, than what Clinton and everybody did. And frankly, so, you know, I'm from up north. I'm from, I'm from Boston. And so one of the issues that we have is that the way architects operated in the north was a different deal than down here. Up in the north, there was always one architect. For every every city had their architect. Buffalo had Bob Coles. Uh, Boston had Don Stull. New York had Max Bond. That that they allowed, there was one architect who was allowed to be kind of the premier architect in each of those cities. By the way, <laughs> um, but. So I, I graduated in 69, 73. We came through that pit, that, that was the, the George Floyd era then, after King got killed, they opened up the door a little bit. And so when I went to MIT, I had eight black classmates in my class at MIT. It, it, they, right now they don't have three. And so, but there, there has been this period where we, the, the door got kind of opened up a little bit but the point is that you students, this is the next opening. And you've heard people tonight say, you can do anything. And um, you know that, that's, we tell you that even when you hit the wall. Because part of the deal is you're gonna hit walls. And, and uh, but specifically to your point about silos, you know, the, my experience on A&T is professors try and break down silos, but students do a better job. And so I've had students who, without asking me, went to landscape architecture and took a class there, right? Or took a business class or took an art class. And so I would encourage all of you to be thinking about doing stuff like that. Um, and it, because frankly, there, there's opportunities for that now that, that didn't exist. Um, and in terms of the silos, you know, I, I, I have the same dream you do, that we would have at some point a school of design. Mm -hmm. Professor Bailey has tried to do it for 20 years, and uh, uh, there's whispers that we might possibly could do it, but frankly, it's going to take student energy in order to have that happen. And that school of design, that, that, well, that's a model in the state that's similar. Um, where the architecture, right, design, the fashion, the arts, 
all go through the same curriculum first year, the first year studio. It's, it's everybody together, from architecture to fashion to arts to industrial design. Industrial design. Everything yes. is yeah. all first year. So there are models that that demonstrate exactly what you said, but there has to be a, a certain level of commitment, a push to desire to do such. But again, what you hit on, I think it's so important, is not necessarily limiting yourself. When we talk about uh, the streets and others, it's the other side. I mean, not only were the architect, professor, also to see the airmen, also, you know, certain military, like the others. And so there were different career paths. So meaning you don't just limit yourself and get focused, but you have to, whatever you're in, you got to commit to doing it and seeing it all the way through. Yes. You got to commit to doing it, and there will be obstacles. That's the only thing that makes you stronger. That's what makes all of us stronger. There must be obstacles, and someone has to continue to break down those obstacles and those walls. And we can go, I mean, there will be a time where, you know, we can, we will stop saying that this was the first black or African-American. Yeah. Whatever you want to put behind it. But guess what? Everybody, especially young people, and not just black, of any color for that matter, um, but what everybody's room, especially if you're a student here, you understand that um, it's not just you alone, right? Just like all of the legacy that we're building upon now, so yes, that was first generation, if you will, so you're talking the second generation, I'm kind of third-ish, six, I, I mean, I'm a, I have you know, children here now, you know, that are seniors and freshmen and sophomores. Um, and so that's a generation. But again, same thing I tell them. Look, you're not in this thing alone. You have a stewardship and a responsibility that is not just you. It's not just you getting your career, you getting a job, and you going and doing you. No, you have a stewardship. When you're in boardrooms, when you're in certain situations, you have a stewardship to sit at that table, be a seat at that table, and lead from that perspective, right? And, and open the door for somebody and, else. And that's the next piece. And continue to open the door for someone else to have a seat at the table. And at one point, it will be the table. You start creating tables, <laughs> and then that's when we start building and going to the next level. Yeah. I like to say Cox. Uh, I know we get a comment. I, I know we get a comment, Mr. Cox made. Uh, I was in a meeting and we had a room, an auditorium full of students, and someone, uh, uh, students, uh, we were, we have a five year program. The state has said you got you have to switch to four, and we were moving fast. And Mr. Cox was at the question was raised, what do the students want? And Mr. Cox said, Well, I tell you what the students want. The students want whether it's four years, five years, six years, we want the best education we can get. That's what we want. And I never forgot when he made that statement, uh, how it shook me. And I say, now I heard people say it's the students, but the students don't do it alone. The students have to have faculty that are backing them, you know. Uh, because what happens is, you students out there now, you're in a four year program, and you have already gone through a semester. So three and a half years, you've gone. But someone has to carry that torch and keep it going in order for someone else to take advantage of it. Okay? So just don't say, I, I, you know, I hear people say all the time, well, the students got to do this, students got to do it. Yes, they do. They have to take part. This is what we want. And, and, and let it be known, this is what we want. But faculty also have to have an input into that. You know, I'll probably, I'm being recorded, I'll probably lose my job, but, uh, but uh, this is just my feeling about it. We've talked about this design school for years, but 
it, it, it seemed like it's just we're spinning wheels. So we need, if we feel that's what's needed, we need to do something about it. We got people out here now that want to see a school, uh, but uh, you got to care, you got to keep it going. If it stops, then that's, that's we, we, we don't have it, we lost. So there is possibilities in terms of what you're saying. We got professionals here, we got alumni here, uh, and so there's opportunities if that's what the students want. More questions from the audience. We need to hear from the students. Well, I'll take over to me. Um, so since, you know, it's been generations, hey, y'all. <laughs> Sorry. Since, do you feel like, how do you feel about today's generation? We have all the resources and, well, not all the resources, but I feel like we have most of the resources. I do feel like this generation can change the world, Did you? but do you think that we're applying ourselves enough from the students that you've met so far? Like, do you think this generation's mindset is different? Do you think we want it bad enough or we don't want it enough that we need a little bit more motivation because we kind of have more more resources and more things accessible to us, like the internet, not having to go through books or tickets. We kind of have a shorter route, not to go through too many bumps and bruises and curves, but we still do How do you feel? You go through bumps and bruises. All of us go through bumps and bruises. Faculty go through bumps and bruises. But what you have to do is look at the environment that you're in. And if the environment that you're in is not satisfactory to you, you have to do something about it. Clint, how, how do you feel about it? Education that AG students are getting today versus, and see, and frankly, there's kind of a couple of things we've got to deal with here. One is the AT education from before, but frankly, the architectural education versus the engineering education. You heard the gentleman talk about staying up all night in chairs. So, all us old heads will tell you about when we were in school and we, you know, war stories that part of the education back then was that when you had a project due, how many days would you stay up? I mean, it was like a badge of honor. That, you, that we'd stay up three days in a row, 24 hours a day, getting the projects done, right? All night. All night. Now that's a bad habit. <laughs> but it was, so, but to your question, you know, the, the way you, the student, Ex, uh, experience that you have today is very different from ours. Um, the other aspect is uh, computer design and and versus hand drawn. Yes. Talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say something. About no, I got to hear Clint talk this way. <laughs> Go ahead, Clint. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, he sort of put me on the spot, really, but. Uh, Ron and also Bob has talked about the possibility of a, of a design school. And of course that would be the best of all things if, if that happened. Uh, back when Mr. Street was here, he thought in, in that whole design closer, too. Closer. Uh, closer, closer. But uh, you know, I guess uh, the power that be decided to go with architecture engineering. And that's good also. But uh, in the architecture program, we still had engineering, you know, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, structures, and that sort of thing. You still learn about all of it. But we had design for five years, every, every semester for five years, if you were to be an architect. Uh, I think there are still a lot of advantages in, in that particular program. And I wish we had that program uh, uh, here in Greensboro, because we, you know, as far as uh, bringing in new people. Uh, I would hope that uh, that you and students, Bob, Ron, and anybody else who can help, try to push it so that we will have a design school here in Greensboro. Now, most recently, uh, the it's called an interior design architect. And uh, UNCG has that program. And uh, 
they have uh, situations where you can be an interior uh, design architect, interior architect. And in that situation, you can come register under that, but you can't do the overall thing. You can't do, you know, the structures or anything else like that. You have to, have to still go back to an architect. But uh, even though that program is, is we, we, we've had graduates from that program come into our office, and they've done fine. But uh, we would still think that a design school, a pure design school, would be great. And I think, and the other thing we've had too, we've had uh, students even from A and T come in, and then they say, "Well, you know, I came because I thought I came to A and T thinking that it was a design school." and it was end up being architecture engineering. Not a problem with architecture engineering, if that's what you want, there's a lot of jobs related to architecture engineering and construction in a lot of different fields. But uh, I guess I'm more partial toward uh, design and the, you know, the architectural world. And so and I know Bob and, and Ron know that anything that we can do to help promote that, you know, we would do that. We've already been involved to some extent along those lines, but uh, hopefully uh, none of us will give up on that until we do have a design school here at uh, at A&T. So, you know, during my time, um, well, let me go back. You need to know the history. <clears throat> back when y'all came through here, A&T, you can call it architectural engineering, but it was a design school. Because given segregation, it was the black school. What happened in 1985 was at that point, the architecture profession came up with a new restriction that said you must get a master's degree in architecture in order to be an architect. Prior to that, you could become an architect with zero academic career. If you worked in an architect's office for 14 years, you could become an architect just with practical knowledge. So in 85, when they made that rule, and a and had an undergraduate program, but not a master's program, that's when our program no longer was a pipeline to become an architect. And so by the time I came in in 2000, what we were relegated to was you get the AE program as an undergraduate program, and then you have to go to architecture school. Turns out, by coincidence, that's my background. I have my undergraduate degree is in architectural engineering, and because the school I went to did not have a, um, a, a credited program in architecture, so I got the engineering program like you're getting, and then went to architecture school, and I kind of like that because it, the, the AE gives you some basics that you don't get in in architecture school. Uh, but during my time here, what I've tried to do is the students who want to be architects that, that you know, try to set you up with the fundamentals here, and then you go to architecture school, and to the young lady's question back here, know that when you get to architecture school, it's much harder. That, that the, the work that you have to do is, you know, the work that you do here is, you know, it's, le it's a legitimate subject, but in order to be an architect, um, you really have to kind of raise your game a little bit in terms of um, creativity, business, um, dealing with people. Um, there's a lot more to architecture, and, and, and you, you learn that in architecture school. Um, and so the, the goal of having an architecture program would, you know, that, that would be the benefit that, that would come to a and One other thing I would mention though is, is that we all talked about getting practical experience. So part of my problem was when I went to school, I, I did not have a, you know, did not come from a construction background and really could do the design without the construction. And it wasn't until I worked for a contractor that I could learn the basics that then you could pile the design stuff on top of. Um, and what you guys have today are internships. 
And so you now have, that is such a fabulous opportunity for you to, that's where you can get that experience now um, as you're in school uh, and then, you know, go on to what whatever you guys are going to do in your, in your programs. And I do have some internships available. <laughs> so not, and, and that's not just summer internships, I mean, readily available right now. So we can talk about that all time. Can I say more? Right. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yeah. one last comment, and uh, we will have to wrap up very okay. shortly. And I want, young lady, I want to answer your question. I think the future is real bright. Uh, I think you all have tremendous, as you know, resources that you should never, ever take for granted. That's why these, this dialogue, this conversation that we had tonight is so important. But I also know it's just like you and your peers, because when you came in, I was sitting there, and you said, well, I need to leave by 7 o'clock. Who do I need to get this thing signed off for? Because I have to go to design. Dance. But that's the point that I'm saying. You were engaged and you stayed because you saw values in the conversation. And for that, I'm encouraged. For that, it kept your attention. And for that, that's what we look for. Yes, I know and I can see it in this room. Uh, the, the future is bright. You have tremendous opportunity to create legacy, to build on the shoulders, and to go out and do things that we have never even seen. So continue to expand, continue to go. Think out, think there is no box. Don't think outside the box. There is no box. Now stay safe. <laughs> there are boundaries and guidelines. But never ever limit yourself. But whatever you do, you have to be devoted to it, stay focused and committed to it to the end. Then go and see how other things you know, tied to it. Your hobbies that you have, the gifts that you have that you're blessed with, expand those, grow those. But seek the opportunity. Don't lock yourself in at all. And get exposed to a number. That's why internships are so important. One thing I teach is that, you know, you try to get as many different interns as you can so you can learn not just what you want to do, but what you don't want to do, what you don't like to do. It's an opportunity. To, so try different things and, and get yourself exposed to a lot of different areas. So yes, it's real bright. Just, just understand you have a stewardship. Everyone in this room has a stewardship on what's been entrusted to you and we're passing on to the now generation. You're not the next generation, you're the now generation. And that's critically key. Yeah, cool. I just wanted to add something before we leave. The other shoulders that we're standing on, the slaves, the ancestors that built, be sure to look at those churches that are no longer. And they were built by skilled people that came out of slavery with skills. And they struggled. But they built something that was meant to last, that's gone because of urban renewal, because of different things. But I want you also to treasure you know, that past and that history. There's another thing I wanted to, a question um, about who, how did you select the contractors, the builders, the ones that were building? I have one oral history, and this is the value of oral history, uh, where Kenneth Lee talks about there was a clansman who was his partner. He was called, his name was Hammer, because he could apparently get the mail and it went in. But he built the house, and during this period, they got to know each other. And after a period, he had gotten in trouble, I think, with Gillespie schools, and uh, was on trial. And he asked Kenneth Lee to come and give a testimony about him, about the values of work. And he did. And then after that, Kenneth Lee said that um, when he was walking out, the clansman, the Grand Dragon, was there with them and said, you'll never have trouble from us again. And so when he was quoted, um, he was somehow with at the Western School where they were having picketing or something. And he was standing there. And the clansman drove past and said, 
I'm in still here, <laughs> you know, in the middle of this. But, um, but my question is, how do you select your builders, your carpenters, and do that? We just have just a few moments. Let me ask you question. <laughs> well, you know, we contractors, we could, uh, we could spend another couple of hours talking about some of the problems related to minority contractors. Because we, for the most part, they have the same problem that we as architects have, uh, getting licensed and as well as getting bonded and that sort of thing. So in most of our projects, uh, we, don't, <clears throat> we don't do many uh, single family res residents, most of the mother family in the world. And so, and then we do a lot of city work, that sort of thing. So contractors have to be bonded as well as licensed. And that's a problem for minority contractors because there's, there's a, a few that's bonded. And so we've been trying to do our part in trying to help uh, minority contractors go through that process. But, uh, now, it's not necessary on a single family house, but when you get into the larger projects and uh, city projects, you know, government projects, things like that, uh, they have to be bonded as well as licensed. And that's, that's a, and I'm not talking about, you, you know, you see trucks running around saying bonded. Those people are not bonded. <laughs> that's, that's not the bonded I'm talking about. <laughs> You know, and so the contractors have to be have to have a legitimate bond uh, in order to bid the jobs, and that's a big issue right now. Like I said, we we spent a couple of hours just talking about the problem related to that, and uh, I, the city I, I have uh, the city has uh, had seminars and I've gone in to talk to contractors and that sort of thing about how to get bonded and how important it is to be, get bonded. But uh, that's, a, that's a big issue. Uh, thank you, panelists, for uh, an amazing <laughs> uh, Man, I, uh, again, I want to thank, thank you all for coming tonight. And before you leave, make sure you get some uh, something to eat, a couple of snacks and some water or something. And wanted to uh, do a quick presentation. Jane, Levy, this is there for you, just for, for being the, uh, the only female on the panel uh, and, and the legacy that, uh, that, that you, you bring uh, to, to us. Um, the conclusion was given a, a number of times by the panelists as far as you know, just some things to think about, some things to, to go home with as, as students and even for those who have um, been out of school for a little while. Uh, you know, just some, some motivation, some encouragement that uh, again, anything that you, that you consider is something that is possible. Uh, sticking to it and uh, so this is something that we just started. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see another one at some point. I, I, you know, this is off the cuff, so but I'd like to see another one at some point. Um, but uh, you know, there's so much more to discuss and so much more, you know, to talk about. Again, we could go on for hours and, and, and days, uh, you know, just uh, just listening to to this panel uh, talk. But. Thank you all for coming tonight, and again, uh, make sure you pick up some things from the, the table here. And, yeah, and just so, one quick announcement everybody from, from Dr. Thompson's class. I need to sign a form, right? <laughs> 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 I have to stay. <laughs> make, make sure you get that. And again, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Dr., uh, Professor Carter, thank you for the, the use of the facility. Uh, and uh, again, you all have a wonderful night.